Okay. Okay. Um, so I thought we'll uh, we'll take some time working through um, uh, a selection of statistical tests that you probably covered in your intro class. Maybe um, I don't know if you guys covered non-parametric tests in your uh, in your background. Maybe maybe you have. Maybe you haven't. Um, but these are uh, kind of some of the basic foundational tests that uh, that you might have to perform in a in a traditional experimental setting where you have data and we are um, doing this. Um, all of this stuff that I'm doing is in. Um, I'm using R Studio, and are you guys familiar with a Markdown? R Markdown? Maybe, maybe not. Okay, so I'll, just a brief, brief introduction to R Markdown. Okay, so this uh, this handout was created with R Markdown, and um, and you can create all sorts of other reports. R Markdown is um, basically in in the past what you would have to do if you wanted to do some analysis and include the results in some kind of handout or something, you know, you would write some code and you would do something like, um, um, maybe we'll do a room width from, okay, so so this is, uh, this is the package that's associated with our textbook. There's HSAUR3 for the third edition, um, but, Pretty much the data sets are the same as from the second edition, but they added a few. Okay, so anyway, we can load the data set up in here, and then we can uh, we can take a look at the room width data, right? And then you know, let's say you wanted to include some of this in into your document, you would have to like copy and then go over to your Word document, paste it, and then you would add your commentary as far as um, what it is that you are trying to show. In your um, in your report, with um, with R Markdown, it uh, it combines all of that into a, you know one document. Okay, and you can you can create either a notebook or R Markdown. They're they're, uh, they're using pretty much the same thing. And then so if you go to uh, under R Studio, if you go to File, uh, New File, uh, a new R Markdown, or you just click from this drop down, uh, an R Markdown thing. What it's going to do is, uh, you know, you can create presentations or documents. Uh, Shiny is kind of like a, a interactive web feature thing, um, and you can say, I want to output to a PDF or Word or HTML, and uh, you know, you, you fill this out, and then, and it always starts you off with this generic um, thing, and almost, I almost always just go and delete all of this stuff. But for the the sake of this, you can just kind of see. How it's written, and and um, and they say uh, if you're not familiar, just go to this link rmarkdown.rstudio.com. Um, but pretty much, it you indicate that you've got headings by using um, this uh, you know pound key symbol or the uh, the hash mark, and then so just uh, a single hash indicates the top level heading, and then two will be a Kind of a subheading, and then more will make things, you know, at level three, and then um, you put in your R code right here. Okay, so uh, you indicate with kind of these three back tick marks, curly brace R, and then a label. This is means this chunk of code is going to be called cars, and then inside here uh, I'm putting in the R code summary cars. Okay, so cars is a uh, uh, built-in data set and if I were to just type that in here into the console then it gives me um, the the summary statistics for the cars data set and the cars data set has uh, two columns speed and distance and this is like how long it took for the thing to break uh, like when you applied the brakes how how far it went and things like that and yet um, and with the R markdown we're just writing the command where we don't have any output here, okay? But you can preview the output by clicking this little play button. Okay, so in the R markdown, whenever you write these three back tick marks, you can also insert um, a code chunk by hitting 
Is it Shift Alt I or Control Alt I? Let me see. Shift Alt I. No, Control. Uh, con on the PC, it's Control Alt I. I think on the Mac, it's Command Option I or Control Option I. Okay, so it's Control Option I, and it will insert kind of the uh, the code chunk, and then you type in. You know, you can do four plus five or something like that, right? And then you click the play button, and it gives you a preview of uh, the output that it will produce. Okay, and over here I, I, I click this, and it does that. But even if the pre, if even if you didn't run that, in um, what you do is you will click knit. Okay, and knit um, will uh, generate the document. And so here I'll just put this, put this on my desktop for now. Okay, so this will just kind of be my test document. Okay, so I click knit. And then it runs, and then, and this is the published document here. And so you can see it takes the code that I've entered, summary cars, and it produces the output. And it takes this code that I wrote, 4 plus 5, and it produces the output here. Okay. You can also include plots. And so for here, um, I put in, we have the command plot pressure. Echo false means do not include the command that I typed here. But if you have echo true and you click knit, then this command will be printed. Okay, echo true is default, and so you have a uh, you click type in plot pressure and it outputs the uh, the plot here. Okay, and the benefit of this of working in a system like this is in a report you rarely get everything right the first time, right? So you work through a document and then somewhere along the way you realize you made a mistake. And then so you go back and you change that mistake. And if you were copying and pasting all of your charts into Word, then you have to reproduce all of your plots and you have to copy and paste all of those plots back into R. And that's very tedious and annoying. But by having um, all of the code in line here, then um, you just fix the error and then, uh, and then you can re-render the document and it will uh, kind of make the, make the necessary changes there. So that's, uh, that's R Markdown. If Again, um, all you have to do is you just go File, New, R Markdown. And then if you're unfamiliar with it or you're not too sure how to get started, just follow this link, rmarkdown.rstudio.com. And it's got a lot of uh, good resources and little videos to, uh, to get you started. OK, so anyway, I produced uh, your handout using R Markdown. And, um, and this is just knitting to a PDF. And so you need to have some kind of uh, LaTeX uh, installation on your uh, computer. So uh, on PC, it's MicTech, and what does the Max use? Is, it, is LaTeX, already, LaTeX already built in somewhere? Probably. OK. So you guys have it even easier. Um, OK. Uh, I have a couple recommendations for supplemental reading if um, if the intro stats stuff or this p-value stuff is uh, if you're a little bit rusty, okay. Uh, there's open interest statistics. is a, It's kind of a free introductory statistics textbook. I mean, that's going to be pretty hefty. That's like several hundred pages thick. Another book is um, What is a p-value anyway? That's by Andrew Vickers. It comes from kind of a medical, uh, he's, he's also a, either a medical doctor or some kind of medical researcher. Uh, doing kind of research in the medical field. So things are kind of from that perspective there, but uh, he does explain a lot of these things. The, unfortunately, when you look it up, it's like $40 for this little book that's maybe, I don't know, 80 pages long or something. It's, it's very expensive. Um, but pretty much all the libraries, all the university libraries have a copy of it somewhere. And so uh, I would just check it out. You know, read a few. It's a very quick read, and um, it co it, I think it, it, does, it does have some good explanations of these things. So, recommendation for checking it out from a library, not not for purchase there. <laughs> okay, um, and then I just have a very uh, just a very very quick refresher on hypothesis testing, which we kind of covered this whole first half of the course or first half of the class. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, the room width data. So I'm basically working through, um, today I'm working through chapter three 
in this textbook on um, Handbook of Statistical Analysis using R. Uh, chapter one is all about just getting started with R, but my understanding is you guys have all worked with R a little bit, and so uh, I don't want to waste your time covering stuff you already know uh, as far as the basics of R. Probably, probably the first half of today's class was stuff you already knew, but um, but that's that's just to make sure everybody uh, we're all on the same page there. And then um, chapter two in uh, this statistical analysis using R is uh, doing um, some base graphics. Okay, um, have you guys used ggplot? Also, yes, no, maybe. Okay. Some, some of you, yes. All right. Um, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of ggplot. Um, right now, uh, in the examples I'm using today, we're just doing base graphics. But, uh, but perhaps one of these days, I'll just do a kind of a quick refresher on uh, ggplot. Um, yeah. It, it, the, the first class in any... Um, program is always a little bit it's a little bit tough because everybody's kind of, kind of coming from different uh, starting points and so some people have uh, done already done a lot of work and other people uh, have done less but um, but I, we've got a lot of stats majors and a lot of applied math majors and so um, I can probably safely assume a fair amount of background whatnot okay so let's uh, let's take a look and uh, and so the first data set that appears in um, chapter three is what's called the room width data. Okay, the room width data comes from um, I guess in Australia they had adapted the metric system. Okay, so in um, or adopted the metric system in the U.S. We're still on imperial units or customary units, whatever we want to call it, and you know we use feet and miles and everything. But, uh, but back in the 70s, Australia said, we're going to the metric system, okay? And then they just said, you know, can people estimate how wide this room is, right? And then so they, when one group, they brought people in, they said, how wide is the room in feet, which is kind of what everybody was used to at the time. And then they all said, okay, yeah, it's 30 feet wide or whatever, okay? And then, um, and then they went over, and they brought in other people and they said, how wide is the room in meters? Okay, and, and they got different values. And again, they wanted to know were the estimates given by meters and feet, are those wildly different? Or do people are people able to kind of compute widths and what whatnot um, accordingly, right? And so um, so that that's what we're looking at here, okay? So the characteristics of the room width data is that we have a categorical variable. In this case, it's the unit, and it's either the, whether the person made the measurement in meters or if they made the measurement in feet, okay? The other variable is the estimate that they gave, okay? So, so people said, oh, I think the, uh, the room is, uh, you know, 10 meters wide or 14 meters wide. Somebody said, I think the room is 40 meters wide or something, okay? That and, then, and then on the other hand, they asked people, you know, how wide is the room in feet? And so they gave measurements like 40 feet wide, 45 feet wide, 50 feet wide, stuff like that, okay? And, uh, and all of these in observations are independent of each other. They did not ask the same person, how wide is it in feet? And then they asked the same person again, okay, now give me your estimate in meters. They just, they had one group of people that gave the measurement in feet and the other group of people. Okay, so the, the key here is that the observations are all independent of each other. Okay, so in this case where you have kind of basically two groups and independent variables, I mean independent observations, numeric variable, the things we can use are the student's two-sample t-test, the Welch um, two-sample t-test, or the Wilcoxon rank sum test, okay? We have to do a little bit of data preparation first, okay? And, uh, and so, you know, in most data sets, all of your values are in the same unit. But in this case, our units are different, so we have to kind of 
convert them so they're all at least on the same scale. So uh, we have to turn all of the, we could either turn all of the meter um, measurements into uh, feet or, or, or whatnot. And so th that's what we're going to do. So is we're going to take all the numbers in there and we're going to create a conversion factor. Okay, so to load up the data, um, I'm going to just do data room width package coming from HSAUR, okay? And then if I if we just take a peek at the data here, okay, the um, kind of the first four rows, you can see uh, if you have the textbook, it's, it's there, if not, um, uh, this is what we have, okay? Um, eight, nine, and 10, these are kind of our first four uh, estimates in meters, and then the last or in this case, five um, observations for feet are, are this, okay? And so what we're going to do is we're going to create a vector called convert, okay? And convert just basically says, because we want to create a, a column of values where everything is now feet. So we're going to say if, if the unit that we're looking at is feet, then the conversion factor is 1. Okay, so when I multiply it, it's, we get the same number. Otherwise, the conversion factor is going to be 3.28. So that when I multiply everything by the conversion factor, we're going to get um, uh, the, the number of feet. So when I do this, we can see um, what we get. Here, let me just kind of expand this. And so convert here. We can see 3.28 for all the observations in meters, which are first, you know, 40 or so um, observations, and then the rest were in feet, okay? And then we'll, uh, we'll just take the column, the width column, and then multiply it by our conversion factor to get our estimates. So we can now see these are all of the estimates that we have, okay? So all the feet, those are unchanged, and we can see that they have nice little numbers that end in zeros, whereas everything else now have decimal points. Okay, and then we'll uh, bind our estimate back to our data set. We're going to say take our data set room width and then let's bind that column there. Okay, and then so now room width is 113 observations of three variables and we can just take a peek at, uh, at our data here. Okay, and we can see indeed that we now have meters the width and the estimate, feet, width, and estimate, okay? Again, because it was in Australia, they spell meters this way, all right? Okay, so that's just uh, what we did to, uh, to prep our data. And then we want to do some uh, summary statistics here, okay? And so we have a few ways of calculating summary statistics. Is one, we can use the apply family of functions in R, okay? So, um, you know, we have uh, basically this this table here, and so we can say apply uh, to the column estimate based on unit um, run the function summary, right? So summary normally you just give it uh, you know a vector of values, and if I did summary of estimate, I don't know where I was typing here. Uh, okay, summary of the estimate it just gives you you know kind of the median, mean, and the max, and the quartiles, and whatnot, okay? But we can say, you know, t apply this, okay? And so it says for those in feet, this, these are our summary values, and for the values in, uh, that when we made the estimate in meters and then converted them to feet, these were the estimates that we see. And so we see a difference in the mean, 43.7 versus 52.55. The max values are up here, the minimum values are here. But there is a difference between kind of our medians and our means, okay? And we can look at the standard deviations. And indeed, as far as uh, when the estimates were made in feet, kind of the, how much they varied from person to person was a lot less, about 12 and a half feet. That was kind of our standard deviation. Whereas when people made their estimates in meters, they were, you know, a lot more they varied a lot more, okay? And, and this would be expected when people are not quite used to yet using the, um, the metric system, right? Okay, um, personally, I like uh, Deplier. I like using Deplier to, uh, 
to kind of create summary tables. And I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with dplyr. I will um, I will provide links to some dplyr, I guess, tutorials or videos if, if you're not familiar. Um, if you're into data science, I would say definitely you want to learn dplyr. Okay, it's 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 a very powerful tool, especially the uh, group when you combine the function group by and the function summarize, uh, it, it, it's, it's very strong, okay? So what I've got going on here is, here, let me just kind of format this. So, so I'm gonna start with the room width data. Um, are you guys familiar with pipes? Like in, uh, in Bash, you can take the output of one program and pipe it as input into the next program. Okay, well, I, I'll, I'll give you links for your homework for part of what you should do between now and next week to, uh, to look at Deplier um, and, and get accustomed to pipes. But basically, I'm just taking the entire data frame room width and I'm going to pipe it into the next function, okay? And the next function is the group by function. And I'm saying group by the column unit. So it says, take that entire data frame room width and then internally form groups based on the column unit. And so there's only two units, so it's gonna form two groups here. And then after you formed groups based on unit, then summarize the following information. Create a column called n, which is gonna be the count that was in the group. Create a mean, column mean, which is gonna be for the groups, for the grouped data, the mean of the estimate column, okay? And likewise for the median, standard deviation, min, and max, okay? And so when I run this, it creates a nice little table uh, with the exact information that we have. And we can see, you know, using tapply, we get this information and with the uh, standard deviation, and we see we get the exact same information using the plier. So, uh, so yeah, I'll uh, I'll provide links and, and whatnot to, to get you started with the plier. Yes. Does it support like functional programming? Um, it does use functional programming to to do what it's doing. Okay, but the plier itself is just the result of Hadley Wickham's work with functional programming. We get to just um, use it for summarizing um, data. Okay, and, and and it's um, it's it's pretty good. Um, I don't know. Maybe maybe it's worth some class lecture time. Um, it's technically not statistical analysis method. It's more so just like data summarization tools. But uh, but it's very it's good stuff. Okay, and then over here we can uh, create a. Box plot. You know, it's always a good idea to just create a little bit of some graphics so you get an idea of what your data looks like. Okay, and so here um, my code varies a little bit from uh, what the book is using, but here I'm creating a box plot and uh, we're taking the variable estimate and uh, making it uh, based on the unit. The data comes from room width, and uh, and this is what we have. This little tilde here means create, as far as the box plot goes, it means create a box plot for the numeric variable estimate. And the tilde is kind of as explained by, is kind of what it means. It's, a, it's the setup for a formula as explained by unit. Uh, and as far as box plot goes, it means create one box plot for for each unit that you see. So we're gonna create a box plot for feet and a box plot for the meters. Um, and that's that's what we have here. And so we can see that, yes indeed, the variation for meters is much bigger and the, um, the average, or in this case the median here, is higher than the median when, it, when it's coming to, uh, when it, the estimate was made in feet. Um, so, you know, just from this graphic it seems pretty clear that there is a, a difference between um, between the estimates that, that have been made, um, you know, and of course we could create uh, histograms and uh, 
that will probably look very similar, just with a little bit more shape um, and whatnot. Okay, so we'll start off with the uh, student's two-sample t-test, okay? This is probably the test you guys all learned in your intro class. And, um, and I don't know, maybe they taught you the Welch test. I'm not entirely sure. They're, they're very closely related, okay? The student's two-sample t-test assumes that both groups have the same variance. That's, uh, that's one of the things. And then, you know, you calculate your degrees of freedom here by doing n1 plus n2 minus 2. That's, um, that's what happens when you do the um, two-sample t-test. Um, it's a parametric test, and, and that just means that there is a distributional assumption on the sampling distribution. So, you know, earlier today we said when we look at the sampling distribution of the sample mean, it looks like the normal distribution, okay? And, and that, that's a result that has been proven as n approaches infinity. However, um, you know, we never have n approaching an infinity in real life, and we just have to say, okay, well, n is like 50, and that's pretty close to, uh, I mean, and that will produce something that's pretty close to the normal distribution, and we can use the t distribution in this case. So there are some, you know, we're putting some assumptions about the nature of the sampling distribution when we use the t-test. And a lot of times, these are fairly safe assumptions um, as long as, uh, you know, our data, quote, be quote behaves itself, right? Um, these assumptions might be violated if, um, or indications that our, our assumptions were violated is if the data has large outliers. If there are large outliers in our data, and our sample size is fairly small, then maybe we don't want to assume that the sampling distribution follows a normal distribution, okay? But if you're willing to make that assumption, then, uh, then you can just use the t-test, okay? And if you're also gonna assume, assume that the groups have the same variance, then, um, then we do that, okay? And so it's very, uh, very simple to run. You just run this command t-test, and similar to the way we produced our box plot, we're gonna say, we put the numeric variable here, the numeric variable estimate as explained by unit, okay? And, uh, and we're gonna say our data comes from the room width data frame. And we're gonna say that we're gonna go with equal variances. We're gonna say variances are equal, that's true. And then the alternative is two-sided. The default argument for the alternative is that it's two-sided. So we could leave this entirely out, okay? So um, if I just deleted alternative equal to two-sided, uh, we would get the exact same result, okay? Because the default argument is that the alternative is two-sided. But you know, if you had, prior to looking at the data, if you said, I think people overestimate the, um, the size of the room when they're using meters versus feet, then you might want to choose a one-sided alternative. Okay, if you want to say, I'm coming in with the assumption that mu, uh, mu 1 for the meters is larger than uh, mu 2 or something like that, okay? Or uh, is smaller than, yeah, whatever it was, okay? Um, in this case, um, because feet, so you have to be careful. Um, when you choose the alternative greater or less, uh, the way R assigns which one is group one and which one is group two is going to be based on the alphabetical order of the um, of, of the factor. Okay, and so in this case, so you can kind of see when you first run it with the two-sided alternative, you can see mean in group feet and mean in group meters. You can see feet has come to be group one and meters has come to be group two, even though in the data, meters appears before feet, okay? So um, if you, uh, and the reason for that is because R looks at that column of feet and meters, and it creates a factor. And for the factor, it, the default behavior is to alphabetize the, um, the different levels, in this case, feet and meters. If you, you can manually set the order of the, fact, uh, of the levels in the creation of the factor yourself, you can do that. Um, but 
otherwise, just just be aware of that, and like um, as such, you'll need to adjust whether you want to use greater or less in in the case of the alternative. So in this case, if we're expecting the meters to be larger than feet, we would have to use the alternative for less to say that the group feet is going to be smaller or less than the mean for group meters. Okay, and then so anyway, it runs that. It says I've done a two sample t test. Degrees of freedom is 111, which is um, basically all of our observations minus 2. It says it's calculated this test statistic t, and the p-value is 0 0.01017 or something like that. So we got a, a, a small p-value of around 1%. And so that means while it is technically possible that the difference in our estimates, the difference between 52 and 43, could be a result of just random chance, um, it seems rather unlikely. It means, you know, our, our best guess is that something like this, a difference of about nine, nine feet in the average estimates, that happens with a probability of about 1% from random chance alone, okay? So now we come to the conclusion that we have evidence that the estimates of the room widths, um, rooms width depends on whether people use meters or feet as the unit of measure. I, I, I didn't show the formulas for how we got this um, test statistic T of negative 2.6147. Is that okay? Do you guys want formulas? Not really. Okay. Well, I, I guess I could provide links on to Wikipedia and stuff, which, which very clearly will also indicate these formulas. But Oh, and they're also in the, the textbook itself as far as how they're calculating these things. But I think we can trust, uh, R is quite trustworthy as far as the conducting of the t-test. And I would say we, you know, we don't ever do things by hand anymore. So, um, so we just do this and that's what it, it does, okay? Probably the most common t-test that gets taught now is the Welch two sample t-test, okay? And this, no longer um, assumes that variances are the same, we allow for variant, the variance of group one and group two to be different, okay? When, um, when we have this, however, the calculation of the degrees of freedom gets really wonky, and, and so we calculate the degrees of freedom, 58.788, um, based on kind of this approximation that Welch developed, all right? And so you can, you can always go to um, all of these things. Wikipedia is actually a really great resource. So you can just say Wikipedia Welch test. And, and this is how it estimates the degrees of freedom, okay? The degrees of freedom is gonna be based on the standard deviations of each group and the sample size, and, and then they raise each standard deviation to the fourth power divided by um, kind of the, uh, the sample size and the degrees of freedom, freedom of this first estimate and things like that. It gets, it gets fairly complex. Um, this is, I guess, why Welch gets the test named after him, um, and that's, that's what we have there, okay? But, the Welch test is widely accepted. No one's going to question this thing, degrees of freedom, 58.788, even though I no longer know what that means, okay? Whereas, you know, the degrees of freedom being a whole number, that has like a physical meaning. Decimal degrees of freedom no longer does, but it's okay. It's, it's an approximation, and then and we get a associated p-value, okay? So this is actually default behavior when you run t.test and you don't say variances.equal is equal is true. Uh, this is the default test uh, behavior and this is probably generally what people use when we do t-tests, okay? The Welch test. All right, and so, you know, when you hear someone say do a t-test, they probably mean just run a Welch test, okay? It's like when someone says, uh, I, don't, I was going to do a Game of Thrones, I don't know. Like if you talk about like the Game of Thrones books, everybody knows what you're talking about, right? But technically, the, 
series is called The Song of Ice and Fire. And, you know, you don't have to be pedantic about it. You don't have to say, well, actually, this is a Welch test. It's just, it's, it's fine. You just call it a T-test, okay? And that's, and that's what we get. So we get a p-value of about 0 0.025, okay? So the p-value here is a little bit larger than the p-value here, which makes sense because over here we are putting even more. There's a, an assumption about the data, of the nature of the data, saying that the variances are equal. So um, we're getting a smaller p-value. When we loosen up our assumptions on the data, our p-values generally tend to get larger, okay? Oh, and here's all, I wrote some commentary on this, okay? So, um, yeah, fewer degrees of freedom will correspond to a wider T distribution, okay? Because the, when you do the Welch test on the degrees of freedom, it's almost always going to be smaller than N, N1 plus N2 minus 2. Um, and so, you know, you're going to be just slightly less likely to reject the null hypothesis, okay? And in general, if you're unsure what, which test you should use, just go with the Welch test, okay? If you use the Welch test and you should have used the equal variances t test, the difference between the Welch test and the equal variances t test will be um, very insignificant in those cases. But if uh, if you did it the other way and you use the t test, equal variances t test, when you should have used the Welch test, um, the differences could be you know, are, are more striking and you're more likely to commit a type one error in that situation. Okay, and then lastly, we have the Wilcoxon rank sum test. Okay, the Wilcoxon rank sum test is a non parametric test. Okay, a non parametric test, and again, um, you could take an entire course devoted to non parametric statistics. It's not, there's one is not offered for the MAS program. There's, I don't even think there's one offered on UCLA main campus, but um, you could. There, there are books devoted entirely to non-parametric statistics. And um, not, with non-parametric statistics, we do not put distributional assumptions on the data. We don't say the data comes from a normal distribution or things like that. A lot of times we just look at the uh, comparative size, uh, the com uh, how the data values compare to each other. So that often boils down to, uh, uh, you know, which data value is the largest and which one is the <coughs> smallest. So we often look at the ranks of the data. So a lot of times when you see um, a non-parametric test, they'll often have the word rank somewhere in there, okay? Um, because uh, basically non-parametric statistics throws away the actual data values themselves and just looks at the ranks of the data. And um, uh, we can kind of compare the idea to, um, you know, business versus sports. Okay, in business, uh, if you lose ten dollars versus you lose ten thousand dollars, that's a huge difference. Okay, when it comes to business, we care about the actual numbers. Okay, in sports, however, if you lose a game by one point or you lose a game by a hundred points, it doesn't really matter you have lost the game, okay? Except in like soccer because there's so few goals, right? But in general, if you just, if you lose by one or a hundred points in sports, it doesn't matter. It just goes down as a win or a loss, okay? And so non-parametric tests, we don't really care about the actual magnitude of the values, just kind of the rankings of the values. So anyway, when you do a Wilcox and uh, rank sum test, the command you run is Wilcox.test and the, the format is very similar to the way you would run the t-test. So the t-test over here, we just have t.test estimate um, tilde unit uh, data is equal to room width. We do the same thing here. Estimate tilde unit data is equal to room width. And it runs the thing. And here we get um, a p-value of around 2% also. Okay. Um, and you'll notice the language is a little bit strange. Okay. Over here, the alternative hypothesis is that the true difference in means is not equal to zero. And over here is that the true location shift. So there's the idea that group one comes from some unknown distribution, and group two comes from another unknown distribution that has a center, something that resembles a center that has been shifted one way or another without 
explicitly using the word mean because the mean kind of implies that we are looking at the magnitudes of the values there. Okay. Um, in general, non-parametric tests are going to be less powerful than their parametric counterparts. Okay, and that makes sense because we are putting less assumptions on the data itself. We are not making any assumptions about uh, the distribution from which the data is coming from. We're just looking at kind of the ranks of the data. And therefore, um, you need more evidence to come to the conclusion to reject the null hypothesis. Okay, you're going to need a, a more convincing case for you to say, um, I'm going to reject the null. Okay, whereas when you made more assumptions, anything that didn't really fit your assumptions, you'd say, okay, I'm ready to reject the null. With non-parametric tests, because we're putting so few assumptions, you need the data needs to be kind of more extreme for us to come to the conclusion to reject the null. Okay, so it's generally less powerful. Yes. Try to explain a little bit in very detail about what you implied by ranks in the non-parametric test. Yeah. So the way um, the way the Wilcoxon rank sum test works is okay. Let's say you have um, ten values in group one and ten values in group two. Okay. We then um, just order them. We take we pull all twenty values together, and we go we rank them from least to greatest. Okay. And then we say okay, this one's the biggest one, or the, you know it doesn't matter. Okay. We just go you know one two three four five six seven eight nine ten twenty all the way up to twenty. And then we take the ranks and we add them up. Okay, if the two groups are coming from distributions that are around the same, then we would expect um, when we add up those ranks, we would expect group one to have about you know a bunch of small you know like ranks one and two and also ranks nineteen and twenty or something around there, um, and um, and the same for group two. So we, when we add up those rankings, we expect to get um, values that are about the same for both groups. Okay. However, if group one is significantly smaller than group two, then group one will have ranks one through 10, and groups two will have ranks 11 through 20. And when you add those up, group one will have a much smaller rank sum. Group two will have a much bigger rank sum. Okay. And so the Wilcoxon test did kind of this figures out the probabilities that you get one you know very large uh, rank sum versus a small rank sum based on um, you know a bunch of different all the different possible permutations of the data okay so these these values it comes from the you know every possible permutation of the thing um, and, and it approaches some Mathematically, it approaches some distribution that they use to, to get it there. Obviously, if you have like a thousand data points, it's really hard to, to figure that out. So, so anyway, that's what it does. And then based on the kind of the rank sum that it gets, it, it uh, finds the associated p-value. So this 1145 is, if you ranked them all and then you added them up for one of the groups or something, is what, what you'd get, okay? Um, so that, that's, uh, that's what it does. Uh, the continuity correction, um, it's uh, when you have really big things, we don't generally um, do the actual permutation calculations. We're using some asymptotic distribution that approximates what, whatever it is that we're looking at. And so um, the Wilcoxon actual, the number of permutations is finite. Whereas the distribution we're drawing the p-value from is continuous and has infinitely many values. And so the continuity correction corrects for that difference between a continuous thing and a finite discrete distribution. That's what it does. Okay. Uh, yeah, like everything else, you can read up on the details of this. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, I don't want everything to just be black box methods, but at the same time, knowing the in, inner details of the Wilcoxon rank sum test, I think is not super critical, <laughs> okay? 
but 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 it's a good question. I'm I'm, I'm happy to try to answer these things. Um, but I don't, you know, some of these things, uh, yeah, I've forgotten um, the the inner mecha mechanisms that work also. Okay, but but yeah, non-parametric tests basically um, they put less assumptions on the data, and so from a practical standpoint, I think the more important thing is that we run the will Cox and rank sum test if we have a small data set where there are outliers. Okay, if you have a small data set and you have outliers, then um, so something like this, um, then that then that would be an indicator that the assumption for using the central limit theorem and thus the t distribution is may is no longer a safe assumption. So that's when we would use a Wilcox and rank sum test. All right, is that okay? Are there any questions on that? Okay, we have also um, the waves data set. Okay, the the waves data set. Um, here, I'll I'll pull that up. Okay, we have 18 observations, and what we looked at was um, bending stress. Okay, so we they, we looked at a bunch of like boats, or it says in the design study for a device to generate, I guess not boats, but some kind of device from wave power at sea. Um, you know, they looked at these things on scale models, and they were trying to figure out the best method for kind of for mooring the device, or like kind of like anchoring these things in the thing. And so they have two methods to compare, and they for each of these things, they gave it like different waves, okay? And um, and so you know with and the idea they want to know is method one or method two, you know, more or less superior than the other method, okay? Um, the key here, so here we have a total of 36 observations, okay? But what we have is 18 pairs of the observations. We don't want to just throw all 36 observations and just say we've got group one and group two and treat these two groups as independent. Because what we can see is that there's a very strong relationship between the value for method one and the value for method two. And, and if we just pulled them and we just said method one versus method two, then the difference between method one and method two would get lost between the differences between the 18 different measurements that we've made. Okay? So, um, so to, to handle something like this, this is what we call paired data, we would create a third column of values which just looks at the difference between method one and method two. Okay, so I would create a a column, and um, and over here we're going to call this mooring diff. So if I look at the names, we got method one and method two, and we can create the uh, the difference here, and we can see uh, you know some of these values are positive and some are negative. Okay, and we want to know okay. Based on these values, is the average of these values, is this significantly different from zero? Okay, so if I look at uh, just kind of the mean of mooring diff, okay, I'm getting a, an average difference of 0 0.062, okay? Meaning that method one is generally a little bit larger than method two, on average, a difference of about 0 0.06. And so we want to know, is that difference significantly different from zero? Okay, and so um, uh, we, we can just run a, a t-test. Uh, before we do that, um, we can run some summary statistics. So summary statistics, we got the mean, we have the median, okay? And then uh, and we can create a box plot of this. Click this. 
Okay, and so here is the, uh, the, the box plot. Uh, it appears in your, your handout also. And so we can kind of see the median is a little bit higher than our average. Uh, and what we would expect, we would expect a difference of zero, right? If, uh, if the two, two methods are equal, we would expect that difference to be zero. And what we're getting is we're getting something a little bit different from that. Okay. Okay, and then uh, we further and we do, um, we can create some normal probability plots. Okay, because when we looked at our, our thing, it looks like there is one outlier. Okay, that's a little bit low. Okay, and we only have 18 observations, so we want to know, okay, is this, is this going to be a problem to make uh, assumption of normality on the data? All right, and so we create the normal QQ plot that's done by doing QQ norm on the uh, vector values that we have and QQ line on, uh, on the same thing, and it kind of produces this line. And then um, <clears throat> basically we want to know, do, do any of these values deviate very much from the line? And it doesn't look like there is too, too much to cause us concern here, okay? So I would say it's probably still okay to do the t-test, okay, the regular old t-test. Okay, so when you do a paired t-test, the paired t-test is exactly the same as doing a one-sample t-test on, um, on the column of values mooring difference, okay? So, so uh, you can see I wrote... Pretty much, I have two commands. I've done the test twice. One is just t-test on mooring diff, okay? Because I calculated mooring diff by taking the difference between method one and method two, and I did the t-test, and you can see the results I get there. And then the other, I have t-test for uh, the values in method one, the values in method two, and I just use the option paired is equal to true, okay? And those two tests are exactly identical, all right, except the only difference is that our outputs, uh, one sample t-test versus paired t-test, okay? But other than that, you can see the test statistic t is 0 0.90193 for, for both cases, that p-value is exactly the same. So, um, so those tests are, are the same thing. And, uh, and one is just the true mean is not equal to zero versus the true difference is not e equal to zero. But it, again, same thing. Okay, so that's, um, that's the paired t-test. And then the, uh, the non-parametric counterpart to the paired t-test is the Wilcoxon signed rank test. Okay, and, and all we do with, for the Wilcoxon signed rank test is we take that column mooring differences Okay, but we give it a positive and a negative sign, um, and, and we rank the values, and we just expect those things um, to kind of even out, the pluses and the minuses to kind of even out if, um, if we're getting uh, something there. And what we see is that those differences are not a really, uh, we get a large p-value here. So in both cases, with the non-parametric test and the uh, paired t-test, we're getting p-values that are over 30%. And so to us, that indicates that we are not ready to reject the null hypothesis. And we say we don't have evidence that there is a difference in the, uh, you know, the measurements produced between um, method one and method two. Okay. Is this all OK? Any questions here? Okay, and then the, uh, the last um, data set that we'll take a look at today is the uh, water hardness data, okay? And, uh, and if we look at the water hardness data, okay, uh, we have, there's several things here. We've got the location and the town, but the two variables of interest that we are, that we want to know about is is there a relationship between mortality and hardness? Okay, is there a relationship between the hardness of the water uh, as measured by some something and, and the morta mortality rate that, uh, that we're looking at? Okay, so effectively we just want to know is, is there correlation between um, hardness and mortality? And so for that data, I calculated the correlation coefficient, which is negative 0.654. The 
And that's just done by doing core for hardness and mortality. Now the default method is Pearson's correlation coefficient, which is kind of the standard you know, correlation that we use. Um, and you know, then that's kind of found by like multiplying z scores and um, and then average, uh, averaging those and taking the square root there. Um, that's what we have is uh, you know for the correlation, and then we look at the plot. And if we look at it, it does appear that you know as this number gets bigger, the other numbers seem to get smaller, right? There definitely seems to be a downward trend. Okay. And so, you know, the correlation we get is, you know, negative 0.65. Is that significant? Okay. And so, um, this may or may not have been covered in your introductory class, but what we can do is we can perform a test to see if the correlation, this value of negative 0.65, is that significantly different from zero, right? So, the correlation values can go anywhere from negative 1 to positive 1. And if there's no correlation in the data, if it's just a cloud of points, you're going to have a correlation of zero. Correlation of one means everything lines up perfectly in a line with a positive relationship. Big X goes with big Y and small X goes with small Y. And then negative one means everything lines up in a perfect line in the opposite direction. Big X goes with small Y and small X goes with big Y. And then there's everything in between, right? And, uh, and maybe you're familiar with the R squared value, which you just take by taking your correlation value and you square it. As far as for linear correlation, so we would just do like negative 0.66 and square that, and we'd probably get something around 0.4, okay, for our R squared value. Is this significant? Well, it depends on several things, one of them being how many data points that we have. And, uh, and it turns out we can estimate this by writing a t-test, okay? But we just call this the correlation test, okay? So all we do is we do core test between mortality and hardness, and then when we run it, okay, the test statistic it produces is negative 6.65, okay? With the 59 degrees of freedom, um, it's the number of values that we have minus 2, because two points define a line, so if you only have two points, of course they're in a perfect straight line. Um, and it turns out our p-value, associated p-value, is practically zero. Okay, it's very small. It's 10 to the minus 8 on that order. And so we have a very, um, so we have evidence uh, that the true correlation is not equal to zero and that it's something negative. Okay. But there are other methods for calculating correlation. There's Spearman's rank correlation and Kendall's, Spearman's row and Kendall's tau. And they're both um, non-parametric methods for calculating correlation that use the ranks of the values again. So um, there's a good illustration here. Let me look up Spearman's uh, correlation. Okay, so Spearman's correlation. So for uh, the regular old correlation, you know, only if it's in a perfect straight line would you get one. So with data like this, we're getting a Pearson correlation of 0 0.88, okay? With Spearman's correlation, we get a correlation of 1, okay? And the reason for that is that there is a monotonic relationship between x and y, meaning that every time x, get, x gets bigger, y also gets bigger, okay? And so if there's a direct relationship that if x is bigger, if, you know, x2 is bigger than x1, and y2 is always bigger than y1, if, that's the, if that relationship holds for every pair of points, then you're going to have a Spearman correlation of 1. Okay? So it, again, it uses the ranks rather than the values. Okay? And, and, they, and so Spearman's is a little bit more um, um, robust against uh, outliers. Okay? Pearson's correlation, I think, anytime you take a linear regression class, they probably tell you watch out for outliers because the correlation is is very much affected by outliers. Spearman's is not. And so, um, so you could uh, do a test to see, you know, what is uh, Spearman's correlation, okay? So in, in our data set, the Spearman's correlation is negative 0.63, not too different from Pearson's correlation there, and then it gives you a p-value. It also gives us a little warning that says, cannot compute exact p-values with ties, which makes sense, because when you have, when you're ranking things, 
if you have a tie in the data, it, it kind of gums things up a little bit, right? I mean, anytime you have a tie, it's hard to truly rank the things. And so when you have ties, you can kind of just ignore it and let, let R do its thing. You can also try to jitter the data. Jitter means just add a small 0.001 value. So one of them ends up being ranked higher than the other. Okay, so you're not really altering the data um, values too much, but you now have to live with the fact that you have altered the data, right? And so perhaps you altered the data in the wrong way and now things are, things are dangerous. But, um, but those are, those are, um, these are correlation tests to see if the correlation between two numeric variables is that a significant correlation or, or could it just be um, from random chance we happen to observe um, observe uh, observe this correlation? So I mean, for example, I'll just uh, we, we got like one minute left, but I'll just draw something like if you had what 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 are you doing? Okay, so let's. Um, so like if you have something like this, okay, and then you know you, you fit your uh, your line something kind of like this, and you get you find r is equal to zero point eight, all right, four data points. Do you think the uh, correlation is significant or not significant? R is equal to point eight. Okay. Well, it turns out that the correlation, if you do um, you, you, can, you can run this. If you do uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 2, 6, 4, 8, as far as x and y goes, and you calculate the correlation due, and if you do a core, core test here, the correlation between these two things is going to be 0.8, but the correlation test will tell you that it is not significant, okay? Um, so I'll do x is... Uh, 1 through 4, and then y will be 2, 6, 4, and 8. Okay, and I can do a plot of x versus y, and this is the thing, the correlation between x and y is this, but if I do a core test between x and y, we get a p-value of 20%, okay? And the idea here is just imagine uh, you're blindfolded and you're given four darts, okay? If you're given four darts and you just throw them at the wall, uh, blindly, okay? What's the probability that the four darts line up in such a way that the correlation ends up having point, uh, a correlation of 0.8, okay? And if you're throwing four darts at the wall, you're going to get a correlation of about 0.8 or something bigger 20% of the time when you just throw four darts uh, at the wall, okay? And so this is not evidence that the correlation that we observed here Correlation of 80.8 .8 is significant. It's not. It's not significant for this data set. Okay, and so um, so anyway, that's what this test is. To, does it says is the does the test does the data? What am I, what am I trying to say? <laughs> Could the data and the correlation we observe be a result of random chance? Okay, or is it some is it indicative that there is a relationship between x and y? All right, and so those are some basic tests um, that uh, you might have learned in your intro stats class. Maybe some of them you didn't learn, but um, but that's what we have. And uh, you know, depending on your background and how much you remember from hypothesis testing and whatnot, um, you may want to review some of the supplemental material. I'll also produce. Uh, I'll post some links to uh, check out Deplier uh, because I think that's a that's a very handy resource. Okay, I'm looking forward to a great quarter with you guys, and uh, I'll see you guys next Monday.